Hey guys, and welcome to the Suitcase Podcast. Today we have the opportunity to unpack life with the Chief of Police, Mr. Paul Prine. We are so excited to share his story. One night in the line of duty, he was shot three times, and that has forever impacted his life and his outlook on leadership. I can't wait to share his story, so without further ado, let's jump in. It's okay, right? Okay. All right. Is the lights all the way up on the side? That little thing? There you go. Is that better? Yes. Is that worse? I didn't realize that. I, I, every time I've been in this room, I didn't even know these lights down. Hmm. Yeah. I was literally sitting there. I feel like it's different. Yeah. Whatever. Okay, you, you ready? Yeah. All right. And three. Hey guys, and welcome to another episode of the Suitcase Podcast. I'm really excited today. I'm here with Mobile Police Chief Paul Prine. Thank you for being on the podcast with me today. I'm excited to unpack your story. So let's jump in. And if you will, tell me a little bit about where you are in life right now and how you got there. Well, Kenneth, first, uh, let me say thank you for the opportunity to come and talk today with you, certainly on the podcast. Absolutely. But, um, you know, I, as you've said, my name is Paul Prine. I'm the uh, chief of police for the city of Mobile Police Department. Right. I have been with Mobile now for 27 years. I started my career at Chickasaw Police Department, and I worked there two years before I came to the Mobile Police Department. And, uh, of course, worked my way up through the ranks. I've done quite a bit. Um, you know, going through it, I've worked on the Violent Crimes Task Force. I was a major crimes investigator, um, a general investigator, such as property crimes-related um, scenarios. Okay. And, um, and of course, being promoted through the ranks. Um all the way up to major before I was appointed about a year and a half ago to become the chief. That's awesome. Yeah. That's really exciting. Yeah. So now I just kind of went through it of about 40 seconds, but you know, (laughs) that was 27 years. Yeah. So there was a lot of work in there, Right. uh, 29 years now, certainly in the making. I I think I always find it ironic people to look and say, man, that guy's, he's successful. Look at him. But they don't see the 29 years in the making before becoming the police chief and all the ups and downs and the things that we have to go through to get ahead in life. Right. Right. No, I say the same thing in business. A lot of time, like the must be nice mentality. I'm like, if you only knew the amount of hours that I've put in to get to where we are. Right. You know, so. uh, But anyway, so what was what 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 led to you wanting to become a police officer? You know, I, I'll tell you this. Um, I think it's likened many times to the ministry. Uh, for me, okay. I, I kind of felt like it was a calling. Um, I grew up in Pritchard over in an area called the Alabama Village. Awesome. And uh, for the first 19 years of my life, I graduated from Biger High School in 1990. And for me, um, you know, growing up very poor, seeing a lot of injustices in the area, for whatever reason, um, from the very earliest time I could remember, I always just wanted to help people and uh, helping those individuals that can't necessarily help themselves. Right. And so when I become a young adult, uh, obviously, you know, that was uh, one of the things that uh, that appealed to me. And uh, certainly I took that career path. Right. Was there any stories as you were a child specifically other than uh, that just it was a turning point in your life where you said like, "Hey, this is my calling." H- how did you How did you determine that? You know, that's a great question. I don't know. I think it's always been there. Um, you know, when I when I say it's a calling, you know, it's trying to help people. So as a young man, certainly right out of um, high school, I kind of tried to figure out as we all usually do what right. am i going to do what am i going to do with my life right and um I, I found it ironic um you know because of what we're talking about today uh, initially i was going to go into the marine corps okay and that was my desire Me too yeah well my my oldest sister uh went into the marine corps and uh, she's four years older than i am and uh, incidentally enough she's also a command staff member with the police department okay uh but nonetheless uh, so i couldn't i couldn't go into any other branch of the military right if right. your sister goes into the marine corps right, right um 
anyway, long story short, I wasn't able to go in there just simply because I have about an 80% loss of hearing in my right ear, and that was primarily due from um, having spinal meningitis when I was about a year old. Okay. And so, long story short, I wasn't able to go in, but that was something that I wanted to do, and it was really just a call to serve. And uh, if you think about it, right out of high school, that was probably one of the biggest hiccups in my life going forward is, okay, now what am I going to do? Right. You know, I was not in a position um, such as a lot of kids are today to go to college right out of high school. Certainly, you know, um, with my upbringing, you know, graduating high school was a feat. For sure. And so uh, that really wasn't in the cards at the time. And of course, I was on my own at that time at at 19 years old. And uh, but but serving in law enforcement, um, really, after the defeat of not being able to go into the military, uh, was very appealing to me. Right. And so then I started looking into it, figuring out where I wanted to be, how I wanted to be. Now, I can I can give you another setback. So when I started, you know, trying to go to the Mobile Police Department, I was a early guy in my early 20s, and uh, I had taken the test. And back then, it was a little bit different today. Back then, when you went to take the test for the police department, there were 2,000 other men and women down there also applying to take the test to become a police officer. It was a really big deal back in the early to mid-90s. Right. Long story short, um, I didn't make it. I didn't get close enough on the hiring pool to be able to make it because I was competing with, uh, obviously, the Marine Corps and right. military guys that right. were just out of the service. And, of course, prior military or prior law enforcement officers uh, that were trying to get on. And so after the first time, I didn't rank high enough on the list to to, to be able to, to get hired on. And I had another buddy of mine that says, well, listen, man, you don't have military experience. You don't have prior law enforcement experience. You know, maybe you should consider going to one of the smaller agencies, get a couple of years under your belt and then take that route. And, uh, I really didn't want to do that. Right. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, looking back, it was probably the best decision that I made because then I went to Chickasaw and worked nearly three years. Right with the Chickasaw Police Department, and it garnered me just enough of experience that when I took the test again, I was able to, because of that experience, I was able to get up into the hiring rank um, for the Mobile Police Department, and I went to Mobile in March of 1997. That's awesome. So in this process, you talked about a couple of buddies. Has there has there been a mentor in your life that's really poured into you, that's helped you along the way? Yeah, that's a really great question, and uh, the... You know, I'll tell you this. Um, my oldest sister was really a big mentor. Um, you know, we, we talk about setbacks, and we're talking about the things that makes us successful. Right. And uh, so as we go through today, and I'm sitting here thinking about it, um, I have a really, really good conclusion for this because the truth is my oldest sister was a mentor, certainly, because uh, my dad, I didn't grow up with a dad. Right. And so my mom and dad got divorced when I was two years old. So I lived Me in too. My, right. No, I'm serious. Like, right. So our stories are very similar. Well, I, I, my mother certainly was a mentor in my life. I look back and she's, she passed on during COVID back in 2020. But, you know, as I look back, you know, my mother was very instrumental in my life. My oldest sister was very instrumental instrumental in my life. And uh, of course, my granddaddy, my mother's dad uh, was very instrumental in my life. But you know, I can tell you as a young man coming up, uh, the challenges that I faced um, were certainly very significant. And a lot of people in the communities are. And what I found out a long time ago is if I were to poll you, Kenneth, or you were to poll me, or we'd talk to anybody else, we're all going to have more failures than we have Absolutely. successes. Absolutely. Um, but I, it, it seems today that most people are focused on the failures rather than the successes. That's right. That's right. I think the hard times in our lives are the things that um, I, I was talking to somebody today, and it, it, regardless of whether it's spiritual, whether it's physical, whether it's in business uh, or your career, the hard times in your life are the things that you will end up looking back at that will be the things that uh, that push you into the future. Like it's the iron that sharpens you, that prepares you for the next step. Well, listen, I think you're spot on. Um, I know for me, uh, they were motivating forces. Um, when I had a hiccup or a setback, I was determined to get up and to keep moving forward. Right. 
And uh, but you know, I, I could go into all of that. I you know, I can tell you that from the time I was old enough to remember until I was nineteen years old, uh, I slept on a couch in a two bedroom duplex. You know, and um, so people don't see that part. That's correct. Uh, when they when they meet you or they see you, you know, we don't see those things, and we don't see the trials and the issues that we all have to overcome, right, to get where we're going. And so, as that defining point for me was certainly that. Um, well, I'll just simply tell you, you know, I, I had not too long ago, I had a guy ask me during an interview and he said, chief, what is, um, what would, what would your biggest accomplishment be in life? And I know what he was doing. He was trying to get me to say, well, you know, it'd be the chief of police position, you know, right. Uh, or maybe considering that I grew up poor, um, you know, that, well, now I have a master's degree, right. And, but, but that wasn't it. And so as he kind of tried to walk me into those particular conversations, I said, no, if you really want to know the truth, I'll, I'll just be completely frank with you. It was outrunning poverty and I'm wow. still outrunning today. Wow. And that was his exact comment. He said, really? And I said, yeah, I said, you know, I said, because for me, you know, about that teenage years, when you really get old enough to, you know, that you're poor, you know, that you don't have the other things the other kids have. Right. Um, you know, that was a driving force to me and to no fault of my mother's, you know, she was just left in a predicament to raise three children. But nonetheless, um, you know, I was determined that, that I would not, um, uh, grow up in those situations because that's perpetuated, right? Right. And only we have the ability to change that. Right. And so that was a big deal for me. Right. So it's funny. It's funny we're having this conversation and the conversations went this way because I was recently listening to a podcast by Craig Rochelle and one of the, in the podcast, he was talking about first generation, second generation and third generation leaders or First generation, you might be the first person in your family to graduate. Then the person after you is second generation, third generation, or first generation business owner, or first generation pastor, whatever. So he was just talking about how the first generation has to fight to get it. But once they get it, they're almost scared of losing it a little bit. Then second generation, they they seen a little bit of the struggle, but they didn't see all the hard work that went into it, honestly. Third generation just expects that... The first, you know what I'm saying? That they just expect the things to come. And so a lot of your story is very similar to mine. So uh, my mom, during a period of time, I grew up without a father. Father walked out whenever I was about seven years old. And she worked two to three jobs. She didn't have a great education. So therefore, she wasn't paid well for the jobs that she did. We've had our lights caught, cut off. We've had our house foreclosed on in there. And I just like it just put a chip on my shoulder. It was like, I'm going to be a good father. I'm going to I'm going to operate in business. I'm going to be successful. And I think Will Smith says, if you get on a treadmill beside him, I'll die before I get off before you do. Right. You know what I'm saying? And it, it's kind of put that same mentality in, in me. It's like, I refuse. Now, I, I'm open. You know, I serve the Lord, and I'm open to the things he has for my life. But I've read his word, and I know that his promises are yes and amen, and it's for me and not against me. So, therefore, I'm willing to fight. But if, if you're going to beat me, you're going to have to wake up early and you're going to have to stay up late. Right. Uh, so it's kind of one of those things where your story inspires me uh, to continue going in the direction that I am. Uh, I hear you have an awesome testimony, and I want you to share that testimony with me. But before we get there, what is what is your favorite thing about being the police chief and what's the toughest? Well, the toughest part about being the police chief is certainly the behind the scenes politics. Okay. Uh, you know, whether it's from City Hall or whether it's from the public. Um, you know, we like to say what we mean and mean what we say, but unfortunately, I have found that there's a lot of politics uh, that goes on right. uh, once you step up into a position like this, and certainly rightfully so. Uh, but it's very hard to navigate when you've built your life on a standard and you said, hey, I am this guy, you know, and I'm, you know, I don't like manipulating people or, or pandering to people. I just say what I mean and mean what you say. But unfortunately, in the world that we live in, right, uh, delivery certainly is huge. It's a big right. thing. The, the thing that I love the most about being the, the police chief is as I went through the ranks coming up in the police department, the every rank 
gave you more responsibilities in the way of uh, changing things within the department and certainly the men and women that you're over. You have the biggest influence. As the chief of police, I have total influence over the entire department. We have roughly a 500-man department, 700 employees, and being able to have that change and change the course or direction that we're going right. uh, is very challenging. Right. And, uh, so for me, you know, we talk about the ministry. I have the gift of it administration. And um, so I really excel and operate in that particular area and understanding where I operate. And I, that doesn't mean that I don't ask for God's wisdom on a routine Absolutely. basis. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, when we're dealing with people, uh, you're also dealing with people's dinner table. Right. And what I mean by that is the, the decisions that we make at the top of an organization affect people at home at the dinner table, good or bad. Right. So, I'm, I, I, I totally understand that. And that has been a uh, one of the things, the way that we've tried to structure our company here is the leadership. And, and I, I believe that we will reach a point at some point to where we're bringing in outside sources for some of the things. But one of the things I've tried to do is to promote the people that are within the organization that have been with us for a length of time that have paid the dues. And I've tried to instill in the, in the people, there's a lot of times when we've got multiple trucks that are broke down, the trucks have to run the following day, so on and so forth. I pay a mechanic here in order to be able to do his job. And if he stays until 11 in order to get the job done, that's his job. That's his responsibility. But there's times where I'll be laying underneath the truck beside him. And he's like, why don't you go home? And I've told him before, hey, I'm not going to eat with my family until you eat with yours. You know, so the decisions that you're making, like in us, as we become a larger organization, it's making sure that I'm passing those down through through the ranks to make sure that they understand the, you know, the same core values that I had, they carry, you know. No, listen, I agree with you, and I think you're spot on. I think you understand as a business person, certainly I do, the biggest asset we have are the people that work for us that accomplish the mission. That's right. And we have to take care of them. And, you know, you'll always have, I, I think there's a rule of thumb, uh, you, you know, 10% of an organization is, are your leaders, you know, 80% of them are your workers, and then the bottom 10 are your most disgruntled people. I mean, there's not a whole lot you can do with that other than try right. to squeeze them out. But I also have the mindset of the church, and that is that 20% of the people do 80% of the work. You're and absolutely so correct. You have to find those people that are putting in and being head and shoulders above the rest, and those are typically going to be your leaders. That's right, and, and you invest you in them. In. That's exactly right. And then when the other employees see that you're investing in them um, – you know, there's a mindset that, okay, well, listen, if that's how I get ahead, then maybe I do it. Everybody's not going to buy into that that's mantra, right. right? But at the end of the day, the idea is that, you know, you promote successful p- people and the people that are going to be loyal to the organization. Right. Obviously, you enjoy being the chief of police currently. And I know you've had a lot of ranks in between where you started and today. Has there been any outside jobs outside the police department or certain ranks that you've enjoyed more than others uh, that you'd like to talk about? Um, you know, there are some uh, positions as a sergeant. I always say the sergeant and the captain rank at the Mobile Police Department are your workhorses. The sergeants pretty much get it done. Right. Uh, and your captains are, for the most part, responsible for the overall mission for that particular, what we call a section. And uh, so I really enjoyed certainly the sergeant's position because you have the most influence on the men, the day-to-day operations and getting things done and accomplishing things. Uh, but certainly the captain's level was much like the chief's because the captain really is the chief of their respective precinct. And, okay. and to put that in perspective, four, we have five precincts at the Mobile Police Department. Four of our five are larger than the top 12 cities in the state of Alabama if that one precinct was classified as a city. Wow. And that would be geography-wise, the landmass, certainly the officers that are assigned to that, and the citizenry that make up that particular precinct. So I, I say it a lot, and sometimes people get a little offended by it, but I always say the Mobile Police Department really is the big show in town. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, those would be the two ranks where I, I felt like, you know, I had the most influence with the men and women of the department. Right. Uh, but certainly the chief allows me to make those changes across the board that moves that department, uh, whichever direction we feel like it needs to go. No, that's awesome. So obviously we're 
Mobile is what the second largest, third largest city in the state of Alabama, something like that. Well, I think technically fourth. Fourth. Uh, okay. We, we we've we have fell over the last couple of years because like Huntsville is just booming. Oh, right for now. sure. And uh, I think technically Huntsville would probably be a run for first, uh, but I think technically we're fourth now. Of course, I know you do. You guys do a lot of things for Sims, and I know Sims is doing things to annex. Certainly, Mobile's trying to make a push Absolutely. to annex, and if if Mobile is successful at annexing then it gives us the population we need to become number two again in the state but it really it's more than about being number two in the state it's about being over that 200 uh, thousand threshold as right. far as citizenry or concern uh, because I think we got something around 50 million for the COVID uh, relief package but that's based on population right if we'd had 200 thousand or more it would have it essentially doubled the amount of grant right. money that we could have got, and that money has really been put to good use. Absolutely. So, obviously, with any big city, you run into crime rate. Uh, you run into crime, and obviously, the police department's doing a very good job doing what they can to control that. How do we make an impact in the culture around us in order to – law enforcement, I don't believe, is going to be able to fix – the issues that we have you know what i'm saying as a right. city as a state as a nation what what needs to happen in our communities to change the culture for good man that is a loaded question but i'm gonna give you the down and dirty on that one all right the truth of the matter is uh the the culture that we're battling today in society not just in mobile mobile county but in the nation probably in the world are spiritual problems and what we need is men and women of faith, men and women of God, to step in and start leading in their respective roles as Christian people. That's good. Um, the reason I tell you that is because as the chief, certainly I see it, um, you know, we're killing each other over arguments. Absolutely. We're fussing with each other and we're trying to one up with each other. And, you know, somebody's going to invariably pull a gun and they're going to pull that trigger. And there's no such action that's irrevocable as pulling that trigger. And the truth is, it's spiritual. You're absolutely spot on, Kenneth. Uh, the Mobile Police Department or any police department is not equipped or designed to change the culture of any community. And let me say this we cannot arrest our way out of crime. If we could, the Mobile Police Department would have already proven that. Right. We do do things in the community, and I know a lot of people say, well, why are you going into the community, and why are you doing all these things? It's not going to matter. Well, the truth is nobody else is doing it. Right. That's a fact, including, the, including the faith-based organizations. Nobody's really doing it. We have probably the last two or three generations, especially of young men, that are lost, not right. only lost spiritually, but they're lost in every way they can be. You was raised by a single mother, as was I, uh, but I see today the shift in a lot of these single-parent homes where the young men are not men. You're a manly man. I like to think that I am too, but that right. was a generational thing. That's correct. We're no longer in that that era of time anymore. And so the truth of the matter is, is we do go into these communities. We do offer uh, the state to partner with us to come in and offer uh, young men or women free training such as welding, ship fitting, pipe fitting. Those type of jobs, they pay good money. Right. And for a kid that has no hope, um, you know, I had a lot of hope coming up. I, I, I tell people all the time the difference between me and some of these kids that I deal with today that, that have a lot of issues or problems is I had, even though it was a single family home, I had a lot of love, Correct. faith, and discipline. That's right. And a lot of all three. And we have a generation uh, of young men and women that, simply are not getting that. They're not being nurtured. They're not being uh, steered in the right way of being productive citizens. And so whereas I was figuring out what am I going to do when I graduate high school, uh, these kids are barely graduating high school, and there's absolutely no hope for a future. And that's so unfortunate. And how do we change that? Uh, the church needs to stand up. And, but I'm also not ignorant and naive that everybody's going to believe like you and I believe. Correct. But the truth is, is we need men to step up and start being men because we have a generation today of young men specifically. And we could go into all the, the anecdotals and examples, but the truth is, is we have 30, 40, and 50-year-old men acting like they're 20 years old. Correct. And so when the 20-year-old sees that, 
well, where's the where's the mentorship? Correct. You know, if he's acting like I'm doing and he's making the silly mistakes that I'm doing, well, this is just life, and we are who we are, right? Correct. You are who you are primarily because of the how you were raised. Absolutely. I am the same way. And so everybody's surprised that now well, these young folks grow up, they come into the community, they don't have any conflict resolution skills, they don't know how to resolve their problems, they have no hope for the future. And we're all surprised that they should just be able to do that. You can hire a young individual from a, the lower end of the social economic class, but you know if they hadn't been prepped, if they hadn't been trained, if they hadn't been taught discipline, if they hadn't been taught to say yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, uh, no, ma'am, uh, the problem is they get in, they come work for a guy like you, and then they're very disrespectful, and the first time they have a hiccup or a challenge with a leader, They want to quit. They want to quit yeah. or – they want to fuss, fight, and argue right. when they're not in a position to do so. Right. Wow. That was good. Yeah. That, that, that's the combination of, um, you said three things, faith, respect, uh, and there was one more that you said. Faith, faith, love, and discipline. Faith, love, and discipline. Yes. I got a lot of, I got a lot of faith. <laughs> I got a lot of discipline, and I got a lot of love. And That's those right. things were like, there was times where my mom, you know, I would come home and say, well, so-and-so's doing this. I'm not raising so-and-so. I'm raising you. That's right. You know, the two things in my life that I would pay my, like, other than just the Lord is my success to is being extremely hungry and extremely humble. Right. It's I will never go in and act like I'm the smartest person in the room because I can always learn something. Right. There's always something to learn. The other thing is the way that I have treated people. You can be the waitress. You can be the waiter. You can be the janitor. Right. You can be the CEO. You will get the same respect out of me every conversation because of not not just because you never know who you're talking to, but every person deserves that same respect. Right. And it's I, I've heard other people talk about me in other social gatherings or whatever. And he's extremely respectful. Right. He's extremely respectful, you know? So anyway, so that is something that's something that I see that's missing. Um, the father has been taken the father uh, in the majority of the cases, the father has been taken out of the home and it's a fatherless generation. And statistically they, you don't necessarily succeed with, with, with a fatherless home. Well, I think the government has incentivized uh, people to buy into the welfare system. And typically, if you look into the welfare system, you can't have a father that lives in the home. Uh, if you have that additional income that's coming in, you know, you're penalized for it. Right. And so the truth is we've incentivized uh, uh, the, probably the last four or five generations as a whole right. not to have the family in the home. and that, I mean, or the father in the home. And, and it's so unfortunate uh, because you really need that mother and that father. I look back today, I really needed that father in the home. And I know people look at, oh, well, you were successful, but unfortunately you and I uh, are the exception, not the norm. That's correct. And, and, and that's so unfortunate because everybody has value. Everybody has an opportunity to succeed. Right. One of the things that I have pushed uh, within the police department is, you know, we— the strategic plan really is threefold. The first, and I won't get into it, but the first one is strategic intelligence or intelligence-led policing. And you know, there there's a concept behind that that we're not just blanketing communities anymore with uh, police tactics. We know those things really don't work. Okay, and right. most of the time, it gives us a bad reputation, and then we we'll end up spending a lifetime as we are today trying to get over some of those. Um, those ideas. But the truth is, is, the second one is community engagement. The third one is the culture of the police department and systemically police departments. And I've worked it too, but I know a lot of people. And the truth is, is uh, police departments, they breed a really negative culture. And I've always said, how do you expect an officer to go out and treat people that they serve with dignity and respect when they don't do it with one another. And so there are some things that we're doing to try to change that mindset about, you know, making people feel valued and important. That's smart. Yeah. And so we'll get there. It's just going to take us a little time. Uh, but I would like to uh, transition a little bit into certainly my testimony if awesome. you've got a minute. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to hear that. So, you know, as I was a, a police officer coming up, I left and uh, Chickasaw went to the Mobile Police Department in 1997. In October uh, of 2001, on the 21st day, I went to work at the midnight shift and um, I had just cleared off of uh, my first call. 
and we were on St. Stephen's Road. I worked in the Tomanville area, the okay. third precinct. And, um, you know, it's a long story, but I'll keep it in brevity. But the truth is, is uh, we heard some gunshots coming from a nightclub. It was then called Gwen's Lounge. And as, you know, we, we th- that scenario unfolded, I went inside, me and, and three other officers, we went inside, and the guy, there was an L-shaped petition uh, in the doorway when you walk in, and you couldn't see anything. The guy had the front door barricaded, but nonetheless, we had to go in. We knew there were patrons there. Uh, the radio was playing. It was loud. We had ma- made contact with the key holder, which incidentally turned out to be the club owner's wife. She said, oh, yeah, they're open tonight. They, the doors should be unlocked. We heard a couple more gunshots before we ever went in, but we decided that, hey, we've got to go in. There's people in here. The door's locked. There's absolutely reason, no reason not to go in. So we went in and immediately <laughs> uh, took on some gunfire, and there was a guy shooting over the – um, shooting a weapon over the L-shaped brick petition uh, that was it right there at the doorway. And as I ran out of the club, I took three rounds to the back, one to the right shoulder, one to the left shoulder, and one to my lower back flank. And, of course, I lost my left kidney during that incident. Uh, but I was immobilized. I couldn't feel my legs. I'd, I'd fell immediately outside the door. Um, I had a buddy of mine pulled me around a car, um, another officer incidentally was shot as well. He got shot in the chest. And, but you know, I had an epiphany or I had an experience with God. And so I was laying there. I had my, my, my Glock in my right hand. I had my radio in my left hand, my left shoulder. I couldn't move my, my, my arm. I was paralyzed from the waist down. But you know, as I look back and look at that scenario, God had me right where he wanted me to be. See, as a young man, I grew up at the bus ministry with Chickasaw Assembly of God okay. and uh, as in the Pritchard. And so I'm backing up just a little bit to tell you where, I, you know, where I'd come to full circle on the night of October the 21st, 2001. So as a kid, my mother ensured that I got on that bus ministry to go to Chickasaw Assembly of God, which is now called Centerpoint Assembly on the interstate. Right. And um, so we went, and Mom made sure that we were in church. And as a young man, uh, probably about 13 years old, I gave my heart to Christ. Uh, But, you know, as time goes on, certainly, you know, we get involved in things life around the 19 years of age when I left home. I simply, when I left home, I walked away from God as well. And then, of course, 11 years later, uh, October 21, 2001, um, you know, I found myself laying on my back and I couldn't move. Well, I knew I had walked away from God, Kenneth. And the truth of the matter is, is I knew had I died that night, I'd have went to hell. And that's the truth. Wow. But, you know, as I was laying there, I have to back up again. As I was laying there, um, one of the things that came to me is call on Jesus. Wow. Well, that was a seed that had been planted some 20 years earlier by my grandmother, my mother's mother. And as a young child, five, six, seven years old, as I, she lived in Chickasaw, and as I laid around in the in the living room on Saturday mornings, I spent a lot of time with them. Uh, my grandmother would just walk through the room. She'd say, boy, if you ever get in trouble, call on Jesus. Wow. Well, I didn't have a clue. I just thought all grandmas were crazy. Mine right. ain't no different. Yeah, you know? that's right. Now, some 20 years later, I'm, I'm immobilized. I can't move. I'm bleeding. What, what I ended up, uh, the, the biggest issue for me certainly was bleeding, bleeding out and, and dying. But I knew I was lost, and so I cried out to Jesus, and I asked God to forgive me and to come into my heart, and I made things right with him that night, so much to the point that when the fire department picked me up and rushed me to USA Trauma Center, the only thing I did is I stopped the captain in that in the back of that, uh, that vehicle, and I said, man, do me a favor. He said, what is that? I said, if something happens to me, just tell my mother and my wife I made things right with God. And, man, that was so important. Now, let me tell you how God works, right? So I'm in the hospital no longer than a week after that type of trauma surgery. Wow. Okay, now work comp played a big role in that because they're going to kick you out of the hospital, right? Right. They don't want to pay as much as they have to pay. But nonetheless, in retrospect, I look back, my mother had given her heart to God, you know, a few around 40 years of age, uh, but nonetheless, a few years before 
that incident happened. And I wasn't in church, but she invited my wife on a Wednesday night to go to church. And then, of course, my wife goes to church, and what happens? She gets saved. Right. And so my wife gets saved literally six months before that incident where I got shot. And the guy that I told you, the captain that was in the the ambulance that, that had taken me to the trauma center, he was also in pastoral work over at Foley Assembly of God wow. across the bay. So, it, you know, people can say what they want about coincidences, but the truth is that me getting shot and me going through all of that told me just how much God loves me. That's right. And you say, well, man, I mean, couldn't he have found a better way to do that? Well, let me tell you. My mother was saved. Had it not been for my mother being saved, my wife, God was laying the foundation. Oh, for sure. And he was preparing everybody in my life for that one night that was going to happen. And so my wife gets saved. It's no coincidence. The captain of the rescue, and I had seen this guy many, many times running on other shooting calls, you know, throughout my career. And I knew of him, but I didn't know him personally. And um, God, man, was just really involved in that whole situation. And I've been serving him ever since. And, uh, and of course, you know, at the time, my, uh, my wife was pregnant with my now 21-year-old daughter. Wow. And um, it was just, um, you know, I look back, and if, it, if that's what it took to get me to come to the realization that I was lost and I needed a Savior, then, you know, the Word of God is not a lie. That's right. Because it's better to enter heaven maimed than enter hell whole. That's right. And so the truth is, is God has really blessed me. And though that's just now that was a big deal in my lifetime, and it's been a big deal over the last 21 years. But the truth is, is you look at all these setbacks and hiccups, and I'm not the only one. I tell people, you know, my my salvation in that regard was very traumatic. But, you know, you don't have to be shot to give your heart to Christ. Right. The truth is, is, you know, you may have emotional issues that are just as significant than That's my correct. traumatic issue. You may have physical issues. You may have mental issues that are just traumatic to you inwardly right. than, than my situation was. Uh, so if nothing else to all your listeners, I would love to just to simply tell you this. I don't care where you at, what scenario or situation you find in yourself. I'm going to give you that same advice my grandmother gave me is when you find yourself in need or you find yourself in trouble, call on Jesus. Wow. That is so good, man. That that is that is an awesome testimony. It, it's, um, that is that is amazing. That is amazing. The w- one of the things that when you were talking came to my mind is uh, we started with it and it's almost came full circle. The hard times, it it breaks all the things away as you're as you're sitting there with holes in your body. The most important thing rises to the top. And it's at those times when things get difficult and things get hard, the most important things start to shine through. That That's amazing. Well, you're really spot on. And, you know, we, but we still have a young generation today. You were taught that. That's correct. Somewhere along the line, you've seen it with your mother working two and three jobs. I've seen it with my mother working. Um, you've seen it with maybe family members. But you had that that spark, that desire, that passion that I'm going to take care of my kids. Incidentally, that was one of my issues is that I'll never walk out on my children. And part of that came from because my dad did walk out and and he's he's passed on and gone and and I certainly don't like him you know I look at I look back and everybody's battling something right it, it's no excuses That's for not correct. doing the things that you're supposed to be doing but unfortunately um, we find ourselves in those situations but for me I was the same way as you I'm going to be there for my children right rain or shine I'm going to be there for them That's right and uh, but those setbacks in life and everybody has them but yet we, we run around in society day in and day out with each other, and we, we talk to each other any kind of way without any regard with what the next your next brother or your sister is going through, the battles they've been through in life. And, you know, we need to learn to show kindness more. You talked earlier, Kenneth, about culture. We need to, to show more kindness to one another. And the truth of the matter is um, it has to start – somewhere that's correct where is it going to start that's right my argument is it should start with you and me that's correct absolutely 
Absolutely. You have dropped so much wisdom today on today's podcast. I want to, before we wrap this thing up, is there any word, is there any word of advice or anything that you want to leave with the listeners today outside of what you've already dropped? Well, listen, uh, one, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to come on and talk with you. Um, But I will tell you this, you know, the only wisdom that I can impart on anybody is God's wisdom. And I'll tell you this, this is going to be for all the believers out there that we're struggling. We're trying to find God doesn't mean that we're going to be perfect. Correct. If we could be perfect, Christ died for nothing. Correct. But I would encourage your readers to read Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8. Okay. And the reason I say that is because, you know, 5 through 7 really is about the believer. Paul was trying to determine, how do I live this life for Christ? That's right. And he was determined that I am doing this on my own ability, my own accord. And when you get back to the end of Romans 7, and I'm paraphrasing certainly, but but Paul simply said, I do the things I don't want to do. I don't do the things I ought to do. Oh, wretched man am I. And I don't think he just ripped a little close. Oh, yeah. oh, wretched man am I, as if it's yeah. some kind of theologian. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I, I really think he had his moment. And say, God, what is this? And, of course, we don't know, but, you know, the Word tells us simply that Paul had this thorn in his side, whatever it was. Some people, I've read behind some people, they think it was a fleshly deal. Some think it was spiritual. It doesn't really matter. God simply said, my grace is sufficient. Replace the word grace with his strength. My strength is sufficient. That's right. And read on. You have to read on through chapter eight. You know, for for m- most people in the in the faith world, knows that uh, Romans eight is is um, um, is the victory. Right. It's the victory lap for the Christian. Right. It's the great eight. That's right. And what it simply says is there is therefore no condemnation for those that are, lives are hidden in Christ. And we have to learn, and I won't get into it and I'll wrap it up, but simply is is we're either going to depend on our own merit, our own flesh to live for God. Correct. Or we're going to follow after the Spirit of God. And the only way to know to do that is you've got to get into God's Word. That's correct. And I think if more believers um, out there, people of faith out there, really get a good understanding of where they're at in Christ and really what their purpose is, we can change our culture. Absolutely. But it starts with the church. That's correct. No, that's so good. I had a conversation. I thought about it while we were just talking. I had a conversation this week with someone, and they were just talking about sin, and we were just having a conversation about it. But through that conversation, I just told them that if you look at the Bible and the man that's called uh, a man after God's own heart is David. Mm. He's not perfect. He's the opposite probably of perfect the majority of the time. But in the conversation with the person I was talking to, I just told him, like, even in all of his craziness, he's called a man after his own heart. And why? Because he could do two things. Because he can because he could pray and because he could worship. And his prayers were not, God protect my kingdom. It's I'll forsake the kingdom, but I I can't forsake your presence. Don't forget about me, God. Don't forget about me. Like right. out of all the stuff. And so when when the world gets crazy and everything, if you will make it about you and the master. Right. Every everything. Well, it's funny clear. you bring up King David because I've always said this: is is there is King David really in all of us? Right. Right. We serve God. We want to do God's will, but then we fall. That's right. You know, we 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 get we we get up, we move forward, we do it again, then we fall. And might I add to your point is God said that about David toward the end of David's life. Right. Not at the beginning. That's correct. And so that really should give all of us believers and people of faith that really a clear understanding that God's not just sitting up there with a, a whack-a-mole stick and That's just right. waiting to beat us, that he's trying to lead us into righteousness and trying to lead us into serving him and following after the Spirit of God. Wow. That's so good. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today. You've dropped so much wisdom. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. I I appreciate your service to the community, to the city of Mobile, and to all the people that you have impact over. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for watching the podcast today. Like, share, subscribe, and leave a comment. Thank you.